Hello there. Peabody here. And this is the Wayback Machine for traveling through time. And this is my boy, Sherman. Speak, Sherman. Hello. Good boy. And today we visit Napoleon. No kidding, Mr. Peabody? I never kid, Sherman. Time? About 1810. Place? Paris. Hmm. The way back was working beautifully. We were teleported right into Napoleon's chambers. He wasn't exactly dressed to receive visitors. Who is there? Oh, you are from the Secret Service? Why, sire, is something amiss? Of course, they are gone. What are gone? The Imperial braces. Huh? The Emperor means his suspenders are missing. Oui. But why are they so important? <laughs> Because they hold up my pants up. Crushing logic, sire. You can't be an emperor without suspenders? Of course not. If I try to draw my sword, see, I cannot order the troops forward. I cannot even salute. And as for making a speech, impossible. Well, why don't you get another pair? Because I am the emperor. I must wear only the imperial suspenders. Sire, who besides you has access to your wardrobe? Only my ever faithful servant, Pierre Lecomo. And where is he? They come to think of it. I haven't seen him lately. Find Pierre, and you'll find the missing suspenders. But where? There! Yes, through the palace window, Sherman had spotted a skulking figure moving toward the gate. Come on, Mr. Peabody! My dear boy, I'm a genius, not a track star. He went this way, toward the docks. In a trice, we were on the docks. Look, that ship's leaving! We'll lose them! I doubt that. When the ship pulled to a stop, Sherman and I made our way to a porthole. Inside was Pierre Lacomo and his conspirators. On the table between them were the royal suspenders. You have done your work well, Pierre. Nothing. When our generals see this, they will know Napoleon is helpless. And they will attack. Then France will fall. Like Napoleon's pants. <laughs> <laughs> But, Pierre, the table is moving. How come? It's simply the rolling of the ship, gentlemen. Yes, it's the rolling of... What? After them! Well, we got the suspenders. Let's run! Unfortunately, we ran in opposite directions. But it was just as well. Quickly! Unless we get those suspenders, our plot is doomed. I've got this one cornered. peek a Ooh, Give me back my sword, you! Oh, very well. <laughs> How's everything, Sherman? Just fine, Mr. Peabody. That's nice. Ah, 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 ah. It's not sporting, you know. Who cares? I'm going to get you if it's the last thing I do. What do you know? It was the last thing. You little pest. I'm going to feed you to the sharks. Be calm, Sherman. My guidebook says there are no sharks in these waters. Goodbye, you brat. Monsieur Lacomo, you seem to have cut the hawser. But when I go, he goes. Not necessarily. And as the rope parted, Sherman dangled at one end of the Emperor's braces, while Pierre Lacomo fell into the murky water. My, seems the guidebook was wrong about those sharks. Well, now to return these to Napoleon and receive the thanks of the happy populace. They don't look happy. Something the matter? Please, Monsieur Peabody. Don't take the Emperor's suspenders back. Why not? Because it is the first day in 33 years there has been peace and quiet in France. The first day the cannons have been silent. No boom, boom, boom. For years our people have had to go around with their fingers in their ears. It's the first time I've seen my daddy in 33 years, too. And who is your daddy? Napoleon. Well, we had kept the suspenders from falling into the hands of France's enemies, but there really didn't seem to be any reason for returning them to Napoleon either. And so we didn't. There they are. That's why in all the pictures of Napoleon, his hand is inside his coat. He's really holding up the imperial pants. <laughs> Once upon a time, there was a shabby little fisherman. Shabby, but neat. 
He lived with a shabby but neat wife on a shabby but neat houseboat in the bay. Every morning, the fisherman kissed his wife goodbye and set out for the sea. One morning, when he was fishing near some odd-looking rocks, he felt a furious tugging on his net. When he pulled it in, he could hardly believe his eyes. He had caught a mermaid, an honest-to-goodness live mermaid. Oh, joy. <laughs> What's so funny, fisherman? Young lady, you're going to make my fortune. People will pay anything to see a real live mermaid. But if you take me away from the sea, I'll die of a broken heart. Are you sure? It's the usual thing. Oh, dear, that would never do. And the fisherman cut his net and freed the mermaid. <sighs> fisherman? What's the matter? You catch your fins in the net? No, I've come to repay your kindness. Oh, that's all right. I promise to grant you any wish you may ask of me. Well... I sure do wish this net was mended. I'll do more than that. Hey! And suddenly, the fisherman was holding a beautiful brand new net. It, it's true. Oh, wait till I tell Honey Bun. That night, the fisherman told his wife all that had happened. Why, I can hardly believe it. Say, Turtle Dove, why don't you ask me something? Oh, I don't know. Go on. Well, I could use a new apron. And so, the next day, at the rocks... Mermaid, mermaid, in the sea, will you grant a wish to me? Little poem I just made up. What is your wish? Well, my wife would like a new apron. I'll do more than that. Go, she has her wish. When the fisherman arrived home, there stood his wife in a golden gown sprinkled with diamonds. Oh, it's everything I've ever wanted. But the next day, the fisherman noticed that his wife seemed moody and discontented. I feel so silly dressing up in a golden gown to do dishes in a houseboat. It's a nice houseboat. It's shabby. But me? I don't care. You must ask the mermaid for a better boat. I don't think... But I do. Ask her for a boat. A big boat. So the fisherman returned to the rocks and requested a bigger boat for his wife. I'll do more than that. Go, she has her wish. When the fisherman returned home, he could believe his eyes. In place of the houseboat rode an enormous yacht with diamond-studded smokestacks, ruby-encrusted portholes, a sterling silver anchor chain, and on the bow, a twice-life-size figurehead of his wife. Well, she ought to be happy now. Milady instructs me to dress you for dinner. But I'm already dressed. This way, sir. Oh, isn't this just delightful? You're as rich as a queen. But if I could be as rich as a queen, why can't I be a queen? Oh, come on now. Go ask the mermaid. But I can't. Of course you can. Jeeves. Uh, yes, milady. And the fisherman suddenly found himself on his way. You rang. It's my wife again. She wants to be a queen. A queen? Silly, isn't it? I'll do more than that. Go, she has her wish. Well, this time, when the fisherman returned, the yacht was gone, and in its place was a solid gold royal barge. On the shore, he could see a fabulous palace. Oh, I'll bet Sugar Plum is tickled to death. Kneel, knave, for Her Highness, Queen Cleopatra. Cleopatra? Her name is Gertrude. Silence! I have another wish. Oh, no. If I can be a queen of the earth, why not queen of the universe? Tell the mermaid I want to be a goddess. No, I'm not going to... Well, if you insist, sweetie pie. Mermaid, you who... Again, fisherman. It's my wife. She wants to be... Oh, I just can't say it. A goddess? Uh-huh. Nearly all your wishes have been heard. Have you no wish of your own? Why, yes. I just want her to be happy. I'll do more than that, fisherman. That was your last wish. Oh, I'm so glad. Go, your wife is happy. And when the fisherman returned home, there was his old houseboat, just as it used to be, and waving from the deck was his wife, just as she used to be. Tell me, honey bun... Are you happy? But of course, what more could I want? Not even a new apron? That one's pretty shabby. Shabby, but neat. The moral of this story is obvious, I think. Be content with what you have, or it takes more than wishes to do the dishes. <laughs> Thank you.
A long, long time ago, more than a year in fact, a little girl lived with her mother in a little house on the edge of a deep wood. It was a pretty house and she was a pretty girl. Her name was Tusanelda Wolfenpickel. But she had such lovely golden curls that everybody called her Goldilocks, which you must admit was just as well. Now Goldilocks had just one bad fault. She was very careless, especially with things that belonged to other people. Children who let her play with their toys always wished that they hadn't. One day, Goldilocks decided to take a walk into the deep woods. It was going to be a long walk, so she packed a lunch and borrowed her father's compass to show her the way. And off she went. Well, about two sandwiches, a banana, and four prunes later, she decided to start back. But the compass now acted very strangely. She started toward what she thought was home, but the first thing you know, she was walking in circles. Only she didn't know it. Look, footprints. If I follow them, I'm bound to get out of these woods eventually. So Goldilocks wearily trudged round and round in the same old circle for hours. Then, alone and scared, she covered herself with a cloak. Well, almost. And shivered her way through the long, cold night. Ah! Now... Just a little way from where she lay stood an odd-looking house, the home of the Bear family, Papa, Mama, and little Oswald. Breakfast is ready. Mmm, <coughs> looks good. Oh! Oswald, stop shouting. That wasn't me. It was Pop. Why, Bruce Bear. Hark. What? Not what? Hark. It's hot. It's supposed to be hot. Not that doggone hot. Oh, all right. Why don't we take a little walk until it cools off a bit? So the three bears set out on their walk, leaving their breakfast on the table. Meanwhile, back at the old oak tree, Goldilocks suddenly woke to a wonderful smell of hot porridge. She followed the smell right to the cottage. There was nobody home, but a little thing like that didn't bother Goldilocks. Oh, joy, breakfast. Oh, that's too hot. I'll put some milk on this one. Oh, wow, that makes it too cold. Mmm, this one looks just right. And it tasted just right, too, clear to the bottom of the bowl. Then, because she hadn't had much sleep the night before, Goldilocks began to feel tired. Oh, these chairs look good. Oh, dear, this one's much too high. And this one's much too low. But this one is just right. So Goldilocks rocked and rocked in Oswald's tiny chair until one time she rocked just a little too far. But Goldilocks didn't care. After all, it wasn't her chair. Still, she needed a place to rest, so upstairs she went to lie down in one of the beds. Papa's bed looked pretty inviting, but it was too hard. While well, Mama's bed was much too soft, but little Oswald's bed was, well, you guessed it, just right. So Goldilocks quickly dropped off to sleep just as the bears returned from their walk. I thought I told you to close the door, Oswald. I did. Perhaps somebody's been here while we were gone. Oh? Uh, anybody here? Oh, what the ding-dong? Somebody's been eating my porridge. Somebody's been eating my porridge. Somebody's been eating my porridge and didn't leave spoon one. Look in the other room, Bruce. Somebody's been rocking in my chair. Somebody's been rocking in my chair. Somebody's been rocking in my chair. And were they ever heavy? Bruce, someone's upstairs. Careful now. There may be trouble. Somebody's been sleeping in my bed. Somebody's been sleeping in my bed. Somebody's been sleeping in my bed. And here she is. Oh! Things got pretty frantic then. Until Goldilocks dashed out of the house and ran all the way home. Now, now, Bruce. She's only a people. She doesn't know any better. 
And I'll bet she sure learned a good lesson. Well, that was true. From that time on, Goldilocks was as careful as could be of everybody's things, even her own. So, of course, she lived happily ever after. And after a little house cleaning and mending, so did the three bears. <laughs> Peabody here. I believe that every dog should have a boy. That's why I adopted Sherman. Shall I set the Wayback Controls, Mr. Peabody? Yes, Sherman, you may set the Wayback Machine for the year 1875. And the place? Dodge City. Specifically, the Marshal's office. For today, we visit that legendary lawman, Wyatt Earp. In no time at all, Sherman and I were standing before Marshal Earp. His actions rather surprised us. You the fellas with the tiddlywink set? Set it right down there on the table till I finish my sword fighting. Come guard there, you varmint. Uh, uh, excuse us, Marshal, but you're mistaking us for someone else. You didn't bring no tiddlywinks? I'm afraid not. Well, then you must have brought a deck of cards. No, sir, we didn't bring any cards either. Uh, obviously, you're quite busy, Marshal, but uh, could you take a moment to explain why you're... Uh... Why I'm fencing and going in for tiddlywinks and card games? Precisely. Well... I gotta get ready to capture Ace's Wild, the worst doggone bank robbery in Kansas. You mean you're gonna fight him with a sword? I'll fight him, challenge him at a game of tiddlywinks, or even go fish. But I'm gonna beat him and bring him in. Has the possibility occurred to you that he may wish to fight you with a gun? Well, if he does, then old Wyatt's going to boot hill. Don't you have a gun? I got part of one. You see, after every gunfight, I always had a habit of carving a notch on my gun handle. I had so many fights, I don't have a handle left. See? Every time I draw, I don't have nothing to grab on to. Why not buy another gun? Or at least a handle? Ain't none around. Them things are scarce out here. You fellas ain't got a gun you can lend me, have you? I'm afraid not. Well, if the aces don't want to play go fish, I guess I'm a goner. Suddenly, the door opened. <laughs> Marshal, Marshal, come quick. It's Jesus Wild. He just left the bank. Did he make a withdrawal or a deposit? A withdrawal. Took every darn cent there was. Well, this calls for a showdown. Folly me. And folly him we did. That is, until he misjudged his footing and... Please. He's out cold, Mr. Peabody. It's just as well, Sherman. Yeah, but who's gonna fight Aces Wild? Belly up to the bar, boys. The drinks is on me. Well, you better vamoose pronto. Marshal Earps, sure shooting gonna come looking for you. You know what I got for him? A bullet with his name on it. Look out, Aces. Sounds like the Marshals are coming. Come on in, Marshal. And come on in a-fighting. I assume your Aces wild? I be he. Who be ye? I be Peabody. This is Sherman. Hi. Mr. Wilde. Where's the marshal? He's indisposed. So I've come to take you in. That's downright funny, that is. Well, I'm the best shot in the West. I doubt that. Oh, you do, do you? Well, get a load of this. Adequate, but hardly extraordinary. I suppose you could do the same. Yes, and without the use of firearms. Hold the glass, please. How's this? Fine. So saying, I went to the piano... Selected E above high C, and... Well, I'll be dog. All right, Mr. Smarty. Let's see how draw me. On a count of three, grab your gun. But you don't have a gun, Mr. Peabody. I don't need one, Sherman. Now, if you'll be so kind as to hand me that tray. Good boy. Now, stand aside. You ready yet? I will be, as soon as you move directly beneath that chandelier. What for I gotta stand there? You will see. Well, I guess it don't matter where I stand. What matters is where you fall. <laughs> One, two, three. You did it, Mr. Peabody. You beat him. Of course. Without firing a shot. Naturally. 
And so, after escorting Aces to a jail cell, we said goodbye to Marshal Earp. Thanks again, Mr. Peabody. You too, Sherman. Adios! Golly, it sure is puzzling. What is Sherman? Well, how Wyatt Earp got the reputation for being the fastest draw in the West. Oh, not so puzzling. Wyatt Earp was also an artist, you see. And he really did draw faster than anyone. <laughs> Did you ever know a boy who got everything he wanted? Well, that was Jack. In fact, Jack was given so many toys by his mother that he became spoiled, and his mother became very, very poor. For you see, she used all of her money to buy toys for Jack until she was left with only one worldly possession, a cow. Except Jack, of course. Aside from being very, very poor, they were continually being frightened by loud thumbs. Thumb! And sometimes thieves. Thieves! which would come out of the sky like thunder. This was very noisy, to say the least. But Jack's mother decided first things first and sent Jack to the village to sell the cow so they'd have money enough for food. Jack was very inexperienced in the world of commerce, so what did he do? What any young boy would do. He sold the cow for six lima beans. Jack, you've never heard such fumming and thing since you've been gone. I thought the sky would crash in on our heads. How much did you get for the cow, son? Six lima beans, Mother. Six lima beans? Why, Jack, you know I don't like lima beans. But the man said they were magic beans. Off to bed, Jack. Not another word. So Jack went to bed without any supper. The next morning, Jack was awakened by a huge beanstalk growing right outside his window. Jack thought to himself, beanstalks this big are for climbing. And so he did. He climbed, and he climbed, and then he climbed some more. Finally, he reached the top. He didn't know that he was in the land of fun. Or is it fee? Jack started out in search of food, and soon he came to a huge castle. He crossed the huge drawbridge and entered the huge gate. Everything inside the castle was huge, too. My, this room is big enough for a... Giant? This is the castle of the giant of fun. Or is it fee? He's a mean, evil giant with a nasty disposition, and he stole from your father. Let's see. One hen, golden egg type, two bags of gold, 14 carat, one harp, singing variety. You must return them to your mother, who was the rightful owner. But remember, the giant has a keen sense of smell. If he smells a stranger, he will say, fee, fi, fo, thumb. And then you must run for your life, because that means he's discovered you. But how do you know all this? Because I am your fairy godmouse. Just then, there was a terrible thumping noise like huge, flat footsteps. Jack hid behind the door just as the giant entered. He was huge. Wife, bring me my hen. And while Jack watched in amazement, the hen laid an egg made of solid gold. Wait a minute. Fee, fi, fo, fop. I smell... No, no, that's not right. Uh... Fee, fi, fo, fum. That's it. Fum. Fee, fo, fi, fum. But now I don't smell anything. So Jack returned the hen to his mother, and she seemed so delighted that the next day Jack returned to the castle. Wife, bring me my bag of gold. It was more of gold than Jack knew there was in the world. Wait a minute. Fi fo fum fee. No, dear, it's fee fi fo fum. That's what I said. Fee fi fum fo. Fum, stupid. Fee fi fo fum. And as the giant and his wife argued, Jack slipped out of the door and was gone. He gave the gold to his mother. She seemed so delighted that the next day he was back in his hiding place. Wife. Bring me my singing harp. Owen, it's you. Oh, when the saints go marching in, when the saints go marching in. Wait a minute. Fee, fi, fo. Fum, and for goodness sake, hurry, I'm being stolen. Oh, I'll give you such a fun. 
home. Oh, when the saints go marching in, when the saints go marching in, how I want to be in the number when the saints go oh. marching in. Jack didn't really have to chop down the beanstalk, for you see, the giant was so afraid of heights that when he looked over the edge, he was so frightened that from that day on, never again was heard a fum or even a feeble fee. Only, foop or tweet. And Jack changed too, for he had learned that there was as much fun in giving as in receiving, and so everybody lived happily ever after. Jack and his mother and the cow. And the fairy godmouse. Thank <laughs> you.